All right, it looks like it's 1030. Yeah, time to get started. So happy Tuesday, everybody. Uh, so today we're going to start topic number 14. And um, I'm not sure how many pages of notes this represents. I know it's a big, fat document and it seems to cover a lot of ground and I don't want everyone to panic just yet. Topic 14 is um, it's uh, infections of the human body and we're gonna cover uh, technically a lot of chapters uh, from the textbook, but the good news is most of it, maybe two thirds is gonna be review. We're gonna talk about all our old favorites, Staphylococcus and E. coli and a few others. I am gonna add some new material to it. So we've talked about a number of things kind of in passing quite a number of times. We've talked about tuberculosis, we've talked about measles and a few things like that. So some areas we're gonna flesh out a little bit more. So really in some ways, this topic is uh, kind of a bit of a review to get you ready for the final. Uh, mostly we're going to be uh, talking about the organisms, but we're gonna talk about them uh, in a different type of topic in terms of we're going to look at body systems and talk about uh, you know the organisms that are giving issues to those particular body systems. And like I said, along the way, we're gonna flesh out and talk about uh, some organisms that uh, we sort of, uh, um, you know, we need to cover in a little bit more detail uh, to understand a little bit about them. So hopefully a bunch of this will be review with a little bit new. And uh, um, I think we're at the point now where we have Wow, can you believe it? Two weeks of classes left. Uh, hopefully nobody's panicking yet, um, but we certainly do want to start thinking about the final exam. So like I said, this topic here is designed to be kind of mostly re review, uh, looking at things in a little bit of a new way, and, uh, and then we will definitely have some time for review at the end. So this is going to take at least a couple of lectures, maybe th uh, three would be my guess, uh, in terms of the amount of material we're going to talk about, but uh, definitely two. And, uh, and then we'll have some review at the end. So uh, just kind of moving towards the, uh, the final exam and the review, the last thing I wanted to say about that was uh, if people have certain things that they want to cover in, in uh, particular detail during the review session, uh, you know, you can think about that and let me know. And uh, when we get to the review, uh, then, um, uh, I'll have an idea of what uh, I need to kind of cover in a bit more detail. Usually I have some questions that I go through and then usually what I do with the final review is, uh, is see what people think they would like me to cover in a bit more detail. Uh, somebody's asking whether I have a practice final exam. No, I don't. Um, unfortunately, the final exams are a lot of work to put together. And uh, I've been hoping to try to have time to do that for a few years now, but I just haven't gotten around to it. Um, like I said, it takes me a long time to put these things together. And um, the final exam, I'm hoping by the time we get to the final exam, there won't be too many surprises for people that they should know how and what to study. Definitely you wanna look at the study questions. All right, let's take a look at topic 14. Uh, we're going to talk about infections of the body. And like I said, we're gonna talk about uh, the different body systems. And uh, first body system we wanna talk about is in infections of the body surface. So infections of the body surface includes the skin. So we're gonna come back to the skin here in a moment. So of course, we just discussed that as part of the immune system uh, as the first line of defense. And it basically consists of a bunch of, uh, you know, dead cells covering some living cells. And uh, there's some secretions and a few other things that are protecting us. So back to the skin in a minute. I want to talk about the uh, conjunctiva, which of course is uh, the surface of the eyeball, and that is an area that is, uh, um, it's, uh, what's the word for it? Um, I'm trying to think of the word, immunonaive or something like that is the word. I can't think of uh, an exact terminology, but it means there's not a lot of uh, immune protection there. There's lysozyme, uh, salt, a few other secretions, but there's not a lot of immune cells. So it, it can get infected. The main thing that's preventing your eye from getting infected is that it's being washed with uh, fluid and tears pretty much all the time. So if you get an infection there, it's called pink eye is usually what we call it or conjunctivitis. And uh, it's caused by a whole 
smattering of opportunistic uh, organisms. So you can see the list there, and you're going to see this list of organisms, uh, Staphylococcus and Streptococcus, and uh, E. coli are often on them, although E. coli is not usually causing eye infections, but you can see there's a few others there. So some, um, some sexually uh, transmitted infections, and you're going to see Pseudomonas aeruginosa on a lot of those lists. Uh, this particular list I got from the textbook and I added herpes simplex 1 because uh, there are a number of people out there that have ocular herpes. So they have uh, cold sores and, uh, and the virus uh, migrates to the eye and it's really hard infection to get rid of. So before I move on, I just see there's a couple of questions. Someone says there's a rumor about a big scary fill in the blank chart, uh, kind of. Uh, I will talk about that in the review, but yeah, um, there's going to be a big uh, kind of fill in the blank. Uh, kind of question on the final that is going to ask you some questions about some of these uh, diseases covered in this particular unit. So it's going to be organized by body system and uh, an organism that causes it. A uh, couple other questions. Someone says the long answers are only from the latest units. Yes. Um, so the final exam is 80 marks, I believe. And uh, if I remember correctly, about 50 of those marks are kind of traditional multiple choice fill in the blank kind of thing and uh, usually I take uh, I think what I do is I take about two questions from every unit so we have um, you know 14 units although some of the units have sections so that kind of leads to about uh, uh, you know uh, that's about 40 questions there and then uh, most of the rest of the exam I'm focusing on the last part of the course uh, including the written so someone's asking about a sty. No, a sty does not fall under this list here. Uh, that would be an infection of the skin that would be uh, near the eye. A sty is kind of like a pimple, but it's uh, kind of in that tissue around the eye. So I'm not going to say much more about conjunctivitis um, other than uh, it's a good place for opportunistic infections. I do want to, uh, you know, I can't just cover every single organism out there. Like I said, I, there's, there's certain ones that I like to focus on in this course. And um, so, uh, you know, with the skin, we want to focus on, of course, the Staphylococcus, right? So uh, we talked a little bit about Staphylococcus epidermidis. It's kind of like uh, Staphylococcus aureus is uh, kind of, you know, gentler, um, less harmful cousin. It can cause a number of skin infections. And uh, most of the infections, maybe about three quarters of them that can be caused by Staphylococcus aureus can be caused in rare cases by Staphylococcus epidermidis doesn't seem to quite have the ability to uh, permeate and affect quite every tissue. It's more of the skin infection, but it can in some cases uh, cause all sorts of other infections. But mostly we want to focus on Staphylococcus aureus here, of course. A couple other organisms worth mentioning. Um, there's this organism here, uh, Propioni bacterium acnes, I think is how you say it. Uh, it's famous for causing acne although acne can be caused by other organisms as well. But I just thought I'd throw it in there because you can see it is also gram positive and it survives on the skin uh, really well. Now, one other organism that I'm gonna talk about and come back to that I've kind of mentioned a few times and I keep saying, okay, we'll, we'll talk about it, we'll talk about it, we'll talk about it, is Pseudomonas aeruginosa. We'll get to that in a moment. So let's talk about staph, staph aureus, okay? Um, We've mentioned it uh, about a hundred times this semester as being uh, an important, uh, medically important organism. So it's a gram positive cocci and it's catalase positive, coagulase positive. Those are some of the tests that we talked about. And uh, biologically, it is, uh, it's just really good at infecting any body system, it seems. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it lives on the skin really well because it's salt tolerant, uh, but it can form slime layers. Uh, sometimes as a penicillinase, so it's, uh, it's uh, often naturally resistant to kind of your basic penicillins and uh, all sorts of other uh, virulence factors. Uh, so it's able to, uh, it has a coag, uh, what's it called, a collagenase that allows it to break down connective tissues. Um, it's got hemolysins that allows it to uh, uh, infect blood cells. Uh, it's just really, uh, you know, biologically, it's kind of scary. And, uh, and very good at infecting people in hospitals, of course. So the epidemiology of it, I mentioned before that uh, kind of it's a transient part of our flora. So about a third of us, a quarter of us uh, have it on us. 
And uh, I've kind of confirmed that myself. Uh, you know, when I do those swab tests, often I'm doing a demo and I do my own hand. And, uh, you know, I, I would say about a quarter of the time I do pick up uh, yellow colonies, which I'm assuming are staph. I don't gram stain them every time, uh, but I don't see it every time, right? So it kind of comes and goes. Um, it's possible that some people are just a little bit more uh, suitable to carrying it. I'm not really sure about the biology there. But it's spread very easily because, of course, we're touching everything with our skin, right? You can think of doorknobs and, and cell phones and, and uh, uh, you know, railings on stairs and those kind of things, which, of course, uh, you know, it's very stable there and can uh, get on someone else's skin. So notice this other one here, pets. Uh, there have been a number of studies that show staff can be found on pets and also uh, farm animals. So, hey, you know, I mean, like I said, found just about everywhere. So what does this mean for a hospital? It means for a hospital, uh, it's causing all sorts of issues because it's uh, really easy to infect. And of course, in a hospital, you've got uh, invasive procedures. So, uh, you know, catheters and IVs and uh, surgeries are kind of the big three where uh, uh, microorganisms can get introduced to the body. And a huge percentage of the time, we're talking about staph and causing uh, deeper tissue infections, which can be quite dangerous if you're already immunocompromised or, or um, you know, if you're uh, newborn or particularly old, those are the types of people that, uh, that have troubles with it. And um, there's this number out here, right? Um, and, uh, you know, it says 50% of nosocomial infections. So remember what that means. Hopefully people remember that means hospital acquired or healthcare acquired infection are caused by staph aureus. So that 50% number is kind of a general number, by the way. Um, if you go to kind of different hospitals in different regions, that number can vary quite a bit from 30 to 90%, right? Uh, sometimes there are other organisms that are particularly uh, persistent in certain buildings and things like that. But Staph aureus, like I said, kind of 50%. Uh, and uh, there's kind of the assumption that around 25 to 50% of those are actually drug resistant, so MRSA. So that's, uh, that's very scary. Uh, so MRSA, of course, stands for multidrug resistant staph aureus or methicillin resistant staph aureus. Um, methicillin resistant is a uh, um, more accepted older term, but I'm starting to see in the scientific literature people are more and more migrating towards the multidrug resistant. Uh, just to emphasize that it is resistant not just to methicillin, but a whole bunch of other things. So uh, there's a little little uh, super bug. <laughs> I have that guy in my office. He's kind of cute. He's got a cape to show that he's a super bug and uh, the number one super bug. So there's tons and tons of stats around MRSA. I couldn't find actually a more recent graph that shows this kind of thing, but the rates of infections, it's possible it's plateaued. In my understanding that it's plateaued partly because of uh, other super bugs kind of getting into the uh, into the hospitals, like I said, Clostridium difficile being a big one that's starting to uh, get more and more cases of that. Um, but you can see that this is something that we've been concerned about and monitoring for quite a long time and uh, lots and lots and loads and loads of infections. So I was thinking about, um, I gave a, a talk on superbugs uh, a number of years ago, kind of one of those public lecture things. And, and one of the things I was thinking about, like if I were to design a really nasty bacterium, Right, you know, and then I just started jotting down some of these ideas. I was thinking, okay, well, you know, I would think, okay, it would be uh, found on all the humans because we're always interacting with humans. But if you think about MRSA, okay, it's found on a whole bunch of humans, plus it's found on objects and animals and other things. It's it's like my imagination apparently isn't good enough in terms of stability. Um, it is relatively stable. Uh, probably my worst nightmare would be aerosol transmission, something like measles. Uh, MRSA, of course, is not, but it uh, doesn't need to be, apparently. And I was thinking, like, you know, 10 toxins would be enough. Well, apparently, MRSA does not have 10. It has something like 70, which is like, okay, again, my imagination apparently cannot think of a really nasty superbug. Um, resistant to, uh, to antibiotics. So MRSA is resistant to most penicillins, um, often tetracyclines, sometimes other classes of antibiotics. It kind of just depends on the strain. And... Uh, you know, so that's there's different classes. So, you know, you, you can't try the penicillins. Okay, let's try urethromycin. Okay, suddenly urethromycin doesn't work. What about tetracycline? 
Now we're starting to look at uh, some more nasty things. Notice I have uh, talking about vancomycin. We didn't really talk about that too much. So like I said, it's one of those drugs of last resort that has all sorts of side effects, but we don't want to use it unless we absolutely must. One of those side effects is actually causing hearing damage. Um, and that's, that's how desperate we are in some cases with MRSA. So let's uh, kind of, you know, shift gears and talk about some infections caused by staph aureus. Uh, and notice I have the word often, you know, a number of these infections can sometimes be caused by other organisms like staph epidermidis or uh, the P. acnes, uh, sometimes pseudomonas, uh, you know, but uh, kind of most of these are, are usually probably 80% of the time it's assumed it's staph and uh, which can be confirmed, of course, with the, the gram stain usually and then other biochemical tests. So, uh, you know, these things are commonly uh, folliculitis. Uh, you know, we're talking about usually a, a pimple or a sty. Uh, my understanding is a sty is just a pimple that's done in that, like I said, that tissue that's kind of uh, near the eye. And of course, it's uh, maybe even a little bit more annoying than a normal pimple because you're trying to blink all the time and it's, it can be painful uh, depending on how much pus is in there. So this is an infection of a hair follicle, right? The bacteria growing in there, you get a little bit of pus. The pus is usually uh, involves some dead, uh, dead white blood cells and, and a little bit of inflammation, which causes the heat and the redness and those kind of things. So usually not too serious, uh, just annoying. Um, sometimes the tissue, uh, the, the infection can get a little bit deeper. Again, this doesn't have to be necessarily always staphylococcus, sometimes streptococcus as well. And uh, we might call these boils or impetigo. So impetigo uh, is, is really, really common, uh, a little bit more common in children, and I'm not sure whether that just has to do with hygiene um, and interaction with other children. If you, look at, uh, if you look at children in general, right, on a daily basis, the average adult, you know, depending on your workplace, how many people are you actually interacting with? You know, maybe five. Uh, if you go to school, obviously a lot more, or if your job is that kind of thing where you're, you're, you're directly touching and interacting people. Uh, not that often. Kids, on the other hand, um, it's dozens, right? They go to daycare, they go to schools, they're touching uh, so many people and, and things all day long, uh, and they're not necessarily washing their hands. So impetigo is that sort of that deeper uh, surface infection, uh, and um, often uh, it makes a rash, uh, sometimes in the hands and, and around the mouth, and um, it's, re it's reasonably infectious because uh, Literally, you're looking at some of those organisms that are kind of festering there, but uh, usually not too serious. Uh, if, it's on the, if it's on the face, obviously, it's kind of, you know, maybe embarrassing or otherwise to have a, a rash like that on the face and, and doesn't look good, but is treatable by antibiotics, thankfully. Uh, so there's uh, a lot more nasty skin infections out there that can be caused by staph. Um, some strains of have uh, certain toxins. I'm not sure what this toxin is called, but it uh, causes something called scalded skin syndrome. And, uh, and whatever that toxin does, it somehow causes the skin to basically peel away. And this is uh, apparently um, usually not found in, in healthy people, but usually it's more immunocompromised people uh, are, are getting this particular condition. So kind of nasty, unfortunately. Uh, and there's another uh, strain out there. Again, you know, sometimes these things end up with these acronyms. So PVL, which I'm not exactly sure what Anton Valentine leukocytin positive means. Probably has something to do with a gene or a toxin again. And uh, this is something I've just seen in the news recently. And it's, uh, uh, I guess this uh, toxin or whatever is, uh, is killing the tissue somehow, making it necrotic and causing these little sort of black, uh, sort of, uh, you know, bruise-like areas on it. And uh, again, I saw this in the news, thought I'd post it up, didn't get a chance to learn too much about it. So uh, another one that we, we talked about, which I guess is not necessarily a skin infection, uh, but uh, I thought I would throw it in here, is toxic shock syndrome, which uh, can be caused by staphylococcus and streptococcus, usually are the two culprits, and they produce, uh, some strains produce certain toxins that are, um, called, uh, uh, considered as superantigens. So superantigen is uh, something that causes kind of a, a, a crazy mass of immune response and could be quite fatal. Uh, I think we're looking at, uh, I don't remember the stats on this, um, depending on the time of treatment, I think, you know, it's like 30% chance of death or severe illness or something like that 
Uh, I mentioned before that toxic shock syndrome is often associated with um, uh, super absorbent uh, tampons, and, uh, but it doesn't have to be uh, the tampons. Uh, you know, it can be any blood infection, and uh, you know, the tampons are just a, a vector for basically culturing uh, the, the organism. So the immune response, uh, you can see some of the uh, 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 symptoms there. Low blood pressure and fever are a big one, but we're talking about kind of life-threatening kind of thing. Someone's asking about hand, foot, and mouth disease. Yes, um, I'm not sure if I actually have that in these notes here, but that's a viral infection and something that is quite, uh, quite contagious amongst children. And um, you don't hear about it all the time, but every few years there's an outbreak and pops up and and of course, they're going to be uh, uh, emphasizing hand hygiene, you know, when it does pop up. Sometimes it ends up on the tongue too, which is, I think, kind of painful for a child. Um, we also talked about septic shock as well, which is kind of related, but not caused by the same toxins here. Septic shock is usually caused by gram-negative endotoxins. So I have some notes here in the, um, in the PowerPoints that sort of kind of describe the differences. If you're interested, I'm not too want to focus on, on the differences too much. Just know this is caused by a, uh, a toxin uh, that's produced by some strains of, of staph or streptococcus. So diagnosis of staphylococcus. So um, often we're looking at a gram stain of the pus or the infection that identifies it as staphylococcus. And, uh, and then usually those biochemical tests, and those biochemical tests are going to tell us is if this is Staphylococcus aureus, Staphylococcus epidermidis, and often um, if the treatment has been an issue, it's going to be followed up by antibiotic susceptibility tests to figure out what is going to work for you to treat that infection. Uh, treatment, um, there's a whole bunch of synthetic penicillins out there, methicillin uh, kind of classically being the drug of choice. Um, this kind of changes you know, every few years because of uh, new research. And I think I mentioned before the hospitals and, and clinicians will often cycle through drugs. So they use penicillin for a couple of months and then they might switch to something else. And the whole idea is if you use the same thing consistently, um, then uh, it gives a more of an opportunity for resistance to kind of pop up. But uh, of course, like, uh, um, you know, we have these strains that are methicillin resistant. And of course, this is a big problem. And so sometimes it gets a little bit more complicated with the treatment um, if kind of the, uh, the regular drugs don't work. Prevention, uh, I mentioned before, you know, hand washing in hospitals, uh, keeping things sterile, being extra careful about that aseptic technique when, when IVs and catheters are being put in uh, is, is a big deal. Uh, sometimes isolating the patient away from other successful patients is, is, uh, is a big part of it as well. Okay, so that is kind of it for staff for now, although you're going to see it pop up again and again and again when we talk about all the other body systems. You're going to see staphylococcus is kind of on almost every list of it can cause this, it can cause that, it can, it can really, really good at infecting all sorts of organs. So let's switch to another opportunistic pathogen, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Uh, this organism, actually, I uh, did some research on, and uh, it's kind of interesting in a lot of ways uh, if you look at its genome and, uh, and those kind of things. On the on surface, it kind of looks like E. coli. It's a gram-negative rod. Um, but when you start to look at it in more detail, uh, you can see its genome is quite a bit bigger than, um, it's quite a bit bigger than uh, the E. coli genome, and it can do quite a number of other things. It's, it, it can grow so many places. It can grow on plants, it can grow in the soil. Uh, it's just very good at growing in a lot of places. A uh, Couple of things about it. It can form biofilms and it's naturally resistant to many treatments. And um, kind of it's the perfect opportunistic pathogen is that, is that rarely does it cause infections in healthy individuals. But if, you, um, if you're, you're susceptible for some reason or another, and I'll show you some examples in a moment, it can be very good at causing opportunistic infections. You can see I have that number there, uh, 10 to 75% of hospital acquired infections. Some hospitals have serious problems with this organism. Uh, some do not, uh, you know, so the, the amount of uh, the range varies quite a bit, but it does pop up in certain circumstances quite frequently. I'll get to those in a moment. 
So uh, one thing I said about it that is kind of interesting is it, when it grows on a petri dish, sometimes you get some interesting colors. Uh, green is kind of one of the more common colors. Uh, sometimes there's even a strain I saw that was purple, which was quite pretty. And uh, this actually shows up in some of the infections. So you can see there's somebody there with a uh, kind of a greenish uh, finger nail infection with Pseudomonas. And uh, here's um, um, just this next photo is a little hard to look at, uh, but I'll show it to you. Um, this uh, man here uh, is a victim of some severe burns. And uh, of course, uh, anyone who's had severe burns, uh, it's life-threatening. Uh, and uh, one of the reasons why it's life-threatening is, is it can get infected. And so you can see this guy here has a pseudomonas infection in his burns. And you can see that uh, a, um, it's kind of got that greenish tinge from, um, from the biofilm that it's growing in. So very, very hard to treat. I just see some couple of questions here. Someone's asking, can Staphylococcus aureus form biofilms? Um, you know what, it can form a slime layer. And, and my, my guess would be that uh, in nature, it probably does to some degree, but I don't think it's necessary uh, because um, generally biofilms, you're, you're often thinking of uh, organisms that are a little bit more uh, um, needing moisture, and that's not necessarily the case with Staphylococcus aureus. But I don't know if it naturally forms them, but it can grow in them. And uh, like biofilms are often, you know, a little bit of a mixture of, of, of organisms in some cases. Um, somebody's asking about a list of viruses and bacteria needs to know for the exam. And uh, I think I'll kind of talk about that a bit more in the review period. So we'll get to that. So what kind of infections are we talking about? Like I said, a lot of different infections. Uh, but these are kind of the typical ones that are associated with Pseudomonas aeruginosa. I, I mentioned this one before, when way back when we talked about biofilms, I mentioned that people with cystic fibrosis, um, it's a genetic disorder and it has to do with their secretion, so in their gut and their lungs. And they kind of make a thick secretion in their lungs. And it turns out that this secretion in their lungs is suitable for Pseudomonas aeruginosa to form a biofilm in. Um, which is unfortunate for them. And uh, people with cystic fibrosis, their, their lifespan is, I think, in the 30s, uh, sort of average lifespan. And this is often what gets them, is the, uh, the lung infection by Pseudomonas aeruginosa, because it's really, really hard to treat when you have something growing a biofilm in your lungs. Antibiotics just don't permeate it. And this is naturally resistant to a lot already. It does pop up in normal infections, urinary tract infections, uh, not as common as... Uh, as some of the other ones, but in some cases it does. There are a number of gastrointestinal infections. And notice you're looking at cancer patients and premature infants, so being compromised somehow, it's very good at being an opportunistic infection. I also mentioned the burns victims and, and various wounds, and uh, sometimes ear infections, and, and uh, in fact, sometimes pink eye by Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Believe it or not, I actually knew somebody who, um, was working on Pseudomonas aeruginosa uh, in a lab and she infected her eyeball by squirting, the pipette somehow squirted herself in the eye. I don't know the whole story there, uh, but, but it caused, uh, caused an eye infection. So as I mentioned, uh, one nasty thing about this organism is it is resistant to many, many antibiotics. And I wanted to actually share some of these. Uh, you know, I, I used to work on this organism and so, you know, you, you look up scientific papers on it. And I'll show you some of the ones I found. Um, that kind of, you know, make you, you scared of it, right? Uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, a phenomenon of bacterial resistance. That one's not too bad, but somebody who's marveling how amazing this organism is. How about this one? Multiple mechanisms of antimicrobial resistance in Pseudomonas aeruginosa are a worst nightmare. <laughs> so there's some optimism for you there. <laughs> Multidrug resistance Pseudomonas aeruginosa towards a therapeutic dead end. So, I mean, these are people that are dealing with this and trying to figure out, you know, what, what drugs we can use to treat it. Often tetracycline is a drug of choice uh, for Pseudomonas aeruginosa, but the, uh, the dosage is a lot higher than most other organisms. Uh, gentamicin too, but I don't think we talked about gentamicin. So uh, there's a whole bunch of other bacterial and skin infections, by the way, tons and tons and tons of them. Uh, I'm just going to mention a few quickly here in passing. Some of them we've kind of mentioned before, some of them uh, maybe I haven't, but just to show you that there's a whole bunch of different ones that can cause uh, some specific conditions. So we talked about anthrax already uh, being uh, something that can cause skin or lung infections. And anthrax uh, has toxins that uh, 
they'd kill tissue and make it necrotic. And so you get usually some sort of specific black uh, lesion uh, from cutaneous anthrax. You can see there's a photo there of somebody with some. And this is the most common form of anthrax in humans. Usually it's people that are uh, often farmers and, and people dealing with animals are, are more susceptible to getting anthrax, or more likely, I mean. Um, I mentioned this one kind of in passing uh, before that, uh, you know, uh, Lyme disease is not the only um, tick-borne disease in Canada. Uh, Rocky Mountain spotted fever is something found in Canada, although it's really minimal. I'll show you a map here. Uh, you know, I was trying to find uh, some statistics on Rocky Mountain spotted fever in Canada, and uh, I can't find the number of cases. I think it's less than 10 per year. So it's very, very minimal. It's spread by two different types of ticks. This map is showing, you know, the distribution of one type of tick is kind of uh, in the, um, the western area. So that's the Rocky Mountain uh, kind of, uh, you know, part of the name. But uh, there's another uh, species of tick. I think it's called the dog tick or something like that, that kind of is distributed in, in that particular area. So not very common, but just wanted to share with you that, you know, Lyme disease is not the only uh, tick disease in town. Um, in fact, there's a whole bunch of tick type of diseases found worldwide. And this is, uh, these ones here are called uh, Rickettsia. Uh, the organism is called Rickettsia. So I'm not going to ask you about Rocky Mountain spotted fever on the exam, but just wanted to, uh, you know, highlight that there are quite a number of other skin infections out there. And uh, you may hear about this one someday if you, if you know someone with the case. Uh, another one too, just kind of uh, worth uh, some quick mentioning. Um, this is another clostridium organism, and this one is uh, known for causing gas gangrene. So gas, meaning it actually produces a gas. I, can't, I don't know which gas it is, if it's carbon dioxide or whatever, but uh, kind of destroys the tissues. And you hear about it, um, you know, sometimes with uh, people in the travels, uh, particularly old movies and old books, it used to be a little bit more common. Uh, but another clostridium organism. So um, it's an organism that uh, um, is, uh, has endospores. So you may have also heard of flesh-eating disease. And uh, um, sorry for the graphic photos. Uh, there's a, you know, you're going to probably have to see a lot of these in your, in your studies as nursing students. Um, and this is, again, uh, you know, it's worth mentioning because you can see the organisms that are often involved. Right? We have... Uh, Streptococcus pyogenes, and we have Staphylococcus aureus again, right? And this is uh, usually, this is pretty rare, and I think you have to be often be immunocompromised to have this kind of thing, but you're looking at a, a relatively deep tissue infection. And uh, I don't know a lot about it because it's relatively rare, um, but you know, you, you do hear about it because it just, it just sounds horrifying. So people often will talk about flesh eating disease. And one more to share with you, just because um, I had, uh, I know a couple of students do their project on this, and uh, you know I think when I um, I was looking for for some certain information, of course this cute cat popped up, and they're like, okay, I got to share this cute cat picture with you. I'm not really a cat person, but uh, it's hard to deny how how cute that little thing is. So there's an infection called cat scratch fever, or sometimes cat scratch disease. I often call it cat scratch fever because there's a song called cat scratch fever. You can look that one up if you're interested in. Not fantastic music, but uh, you know, kind of catchy in some ways. And uh, so this is caused by a specific bacterium that is spread from cat to cat by fleas. And uh, it can be uh, transmitted to humans, uh, you know, from scratches or bites or just, you know, I mean, sometimes people are playing with the cat and, and uh, they get cat saliva on themselves and then, uh, then self-infect themselves. So this will infect the lymphatic tissues and uh, cause fevers and a few other symptoms. So something just, you know, like I said, kind of out of interest there. So I see there's a question or two. Um, somebody's asking about clustered imperfringes uh, causing trench foot. And yes, yeah, so it, it's associated with war often, yeah, where people get wounds and uh, they're keeping their, their foot in their boot for days on end and, uh, and those kind of conditions where, you know, they're, they're going to incubate the organism quite well. And uh, I will not be singing Cat Scratch Fever. I can't even remember the tune, but uh, I'm not going to sing for you, not today. Maybe another time. So uh, there's quite a number of organisms out there that can cause skin infections and other soft tissue infections, right? So, I mean, 
let's just think about, you know, like I said, those organisms that um, we've talked about a lot. We've talked about the, the Streptococci group A. Strep is, of course, is Streptococcus pyogenes, Staphylococcus, and Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Those are kind of the important ones uh, that we need to know for this course. Uh, the other ones, you know, worth mentioning here or there, and you may see them in your travels. So I'm going to switch gears and I want to talk about some viral infections of the, uh, of the skin. And, uh, you know, kind of like the bacterial infections, these viral infections don't have to just infect the skin. Sometimes they're infecting multiple body systems. Um, but some of these ones we've talked about is kind of uh, infections that, uh, uh, you know, are often associated with the skin, right? So we've got the herpes viruses. And uh, there were how many herpes viruses? Eight, I think there's eight, eight uh, human herpes viruses. And uh, there were four that were important to know for this class, uh, kind of the most common ones. And uh, three of them are associated with skin infections. So you can see we have herpes simplex one, herpes simplex two, and varicella zoster virus, also sometimes known as the chicken pox virus, right? So herpes simplex one and herpes simplex two are, are uh, associated uh, usually with oral herpes and genital herpes. Usually number one is cold sores and number two is genital herpes, but both can cause infections in both areas. It's just more likely to be one um, if, it's, if it's cold sore, more likely to be number two if it's genital herpes. So the transmission is a little bit different, of course. We have uh, uh, usually oral herpes, uh, you know, people will get it when they're, when they're young, um, you know, just from contact with family members. Uh, genital herpes more likely to be spread uh, um, when someone's older, when, they, when they're um, becoming sexually active, right? So these are uh, herpes viruses, so they're lifelong infections, and uh, the viruses will hide and sometimes reflare and, and, and uh, uh, come back. Uh, and as I mentioned before, they can infect other body systems like the eye. Uh, in some cases, people get ocular herpes, and uh, it's, it's very, very hard to treat because uh, you can't get rid of the virus. Uh, if you have HIV, sometimes you get disseminated herpes, which is herpes simplex kind of uh, branching out and, and, uh, and causing uh, blisters in, in other parts of the body. So varicella zoster, or sometimes just called varicella, is of course the, um, the virus that causes chicken pox and shingles. And, uh, you know, like I said, this has been very interesting um, time to be living to see that uh, you know, um, we're kind of at this stage where some of you may have had chicken pox uh, as a child, and some of you, probably, most of you probably are old or young enough now to not have had chicken pox because of the vaccine. And uh, so, you know, who knows? Like, this used to be a rite of passage for almost every child in Canada. Uh, you would get chicken pox, and sometimes you get it when you're three, sometimes, you know, often five-ish, you know, kind of when, when kids are, are going to school and uh, you know, that's kind of when often people get it. Sometimes it'd be a little bit later. Um, I think uh, I know someone who said uh, she had it when she was 15. And of course, that was really embarrassing being a teenager and having chicken pox <laughs> uh, for some reason. Um, but yeah, uh, it was a rite of passage. Um, usually not serious, but in some cases it can be serious and complications like pneumonia and other things. And, uh, you know, the worst thing about chickenpox would be getting the blisters and sometimes the scars. So my son had chickenpox when he was, I think, three years old. And he has a couple of scars, one of them being right in where his eyebrow is. So there's a little piece of his eyebrow that doesn't grow because there's a chickenpox scar there. Thankfully, it wasn't like, you know, right too noticeable. But, uh, you know, it's, it, no one wants to have, uh, you know, scars on their face, right? So, uh, like I said, this is a herpes virus infection in hides, and uh, it goes dormant. And uh, a lot of people will, who've had chicken pox, someday develop shingles. And your risk increases uh, quite dramatically once you hit around 60. So, uh, you know, as your, your immune system uh, gets a little more worn down and those memory cells, they start to disappear. Uh, so, you know, you're looking at, like I said, here's, here's a classic case of a disease where those memory cells last, you know, easily 50 years. Um, but eventually they do start to wane and, uh, and people can get shingles and you end up with a blister often on your chest and, uh, and, and also in the nerve ganglia. So it can, it can be quite painful. Uh, people have a hard time moving around. Uh, I've known a number of people that have had shingles um, at much younger ages. I had a good friend who had it when I think he was 30. 
and he had it bad. Like he literally missed six weeks of work due to shingles. Um, I know somebody else, uh, one of my colleagues here who had it and he was, he was uh, off work for only two weeks. Um, so in some cases it's six months. And uh, I think in every case, somebody who said it, they did not have good things to say about uh, shingles. So poor them. And, uh, and now, because we have a vaccine for chickenpox, you know, that's the, that's the same virus that causes shingles, uh, we're starting to give people that vaccine. It's, I think it's a slightly different formulation, like maybe it's a higher concentration because an adult is bigger than a child. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure what age it is in Alberta. They've changed it every few years, but it used to be once you're 60, you can get this vaccine. Um, and so again, this might be something that disappears and people will, will have a less likely chance of getting it. Now, the last thing I want to say about that is that, um, you know, we have this vaccine for chickenpox and uh, we haven't had it for 50 years, right? So we don't know whether the chickenpox vaccine is going to give us memory cells for 50 years. So there might be a time where they uh, recommend you get a booster every 20 years or every 10 years or something like that. There might be a time where they start to look at the data and realize that maybe we should be giving people the shingles vaccine when they're 55. And so, you know, this is kind of uh, the way it works with us. You know, we collect data and eventually they make recommendations and sometimes you change them. So I see some people have some comments about knowing people that were younger, 19 and 23 with shingles. And yeah, like I said, it's more common than people suspect. Uh, but if you know anybody who's uh, kind of, you know, in their 50s or 60s, uh, you know, um, there, there's a decent chance you get it. I can't remember the stats on it, but it's a, it's a lot higher than most people uh, suspect. So I have a couple of questions here. Someone's saying they had chicken pox when they were a kid and says it's taking the vaccine still help reduce the risk of getting shingles. Yes. Um, so the vaccine is, uh, is kind of like, uh, you know, kind of like a booster shot to your original immunity. And, uh, but like I said, we're kind of, you know, still working on getting the data for that. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll see, um, we'll see what, what kind of changes occur. I know when the, when the uh, shingles vaccine first came out, it wasn't 60. I think it was uh, 65, but they've, they've dropped that to 60 now. Okay, so let's talk about another uh, disease that is preventable by vaccine, which I've mentioned uh, a number of times uh, this semester is measles. And, uh, you know, I used to not talk a lot about measles in this course. Um, because for all intents and purposes, it was eradicated in Canada. And unfortunately, uh, it's been making a bit of a comeback uh, because of people not getting um, their children vaccinated, which I think is, uh, is a real uh, a tragedy uh, that we have almost gotten rid of a disease such as measles. Um, you know, measles uh, also used to be a rite of passage for children. And this is, uh, this is before my time. Um, but I have, uh, I have a sister who is, uh, I don't know, I think she's 13 years older than me. And uh, so, you know, not much before my time. And she had measles as a child, just like everybody else did at the time, right? And uh, so let's talk a little bit about measles. You can see it kind of has another name, rubiola. Let's not get that mixed up with rubella. We'll talk about rubella uh, briefly in a moment here. But rubiola is another name for measles. So you can see it's a virus. Um, and it's uh, enveloped, it's an RNA virus, and it's associated with a fever and this rash, right? Those are kind of the big symptoms. And the, the, the rash apparently doesn't show up right away, and it can be covered over the entire body. And, uh, you know, uh, um, this is what it looks like apparently. And there are some places that it's still pretty common uh, in the world, um, particularly uh, certain areas in Africa uh, where the vaccinations, you know, are too expensive or just not, uh, uh, permeating um, certain areas quite as well. And uh, so if you're from Africa, you might be a little more familiar with, uh, with measles than, than I am. Like I said, I've never seen it in my lifetime. But there's lots that can be said about measles uh, in terms of uh, it is uh, quite dangerous to get. It's a lot more serious than chickenpox. You can see there's some stats there, right? Is that about one in four children who get measles will be hospitalized and uh, about two in a, in, in a thousand will die. Uh, that's, that's pretty high, right? Um, and uh, I'll show you some stats in a minute. Um, but this year, uh, due to uh, just the COVID-19 pandemic and the vaccine, uh, people just not getting vaccinated as much, uh, 
there's been, I think, 300,000 deaths due to measles uh, uh, worldwide this year, which is, uh, I think, double the usual number, which is unfortunate. So like I said before, uh, a few times I'd mentioned that measles may be the most infectious thing that we know of. Uh, it is crazy infectious. This, uh, this virus, you know, it's known for uh, causing skin lesions, but it also is infecting uh, macrophages in the lung. And uh, you can imagine with anything where there's a cough and there's viruses involved uh, kind of in that part of the body, uh, the cough is going to expel those viral particles. And the viral particles are airborne. So I mentioned before uh, respiratory diseases, if it's, if it's droplet, uh, you know, the droplets kind of go out and they, they, they can go usually about a meter is the furthest they go and then gravity drops to the ground. This is a true airborne disease where the virus itself will hang around uh, in the air for hours. Uh, there was one study I was reading about a couple of years ago where uh, I don't know exactly how they do this kind of study, but uh, you know, somebody with measles was in a room and uh, and someone came in three and a half hours later and got measles, right? So, uh, you know, somebody who wasn't vaccinated. Uh, so this must have been some study in the school. It was floating around in the air. And uh, it's so infectious that about 90% of people who are exposed to measles, uh, who are not vaccinated or immune, will get measles. Um, so like I said, rite of passage, everybody got it. As soon as measles was around in your town, uh, every kid who is not immune uh, would get it very, very quickly. So uh, very, very infectious. And so when people talk about airborne diseases, this is kind of the worst case scenario. Uh, and uh, you know, something that we always think about when we're talking about new respiratory pathogens. So um, just a few other notes about it. You can see, I think I've said some of these things already. Uh, uh, you know, normally 100,000 deaths, you can see I put that, that stat for year 2020 and uh, I'm not sure about that stat because I actually just this morning I saw another stat that said 230,000. So, um, you know, I'm not sure about those exact numbers, but my point is it's, it's at least double than what it is normal. And this is a problem every time. I know when we had that uh, big Ebola epidemic uh, in, uh, um, what was that, 2014, 2015, uh, was that in the Congo? Um, Trying to remember, uh, trying to remember which epidemic it was talking about. Uh, it was an Ebola epidemic. Camera was the most recent one, or the one before that, and they're talking about how you know there were X number of thousand cases, right? But what wasn't really publicized so much was that you know when you have an Ebola epidemic uh, in a region like that, people they're not getting their, their kids uh, vaccinated normally, and there were uh, something like five times the number of deaths from from measles. And so this is the effect from from. Um, from uh, pandemics, even if they're not serious, uh, you know, we start getting uh, more measles and things like that, uh, particularly for people who cannot afford to, uh, to do so. Complications, uh, respiratory complications and, and encephalitis, which is uh, encephalitis can be dangerous and cause deaths. And uh, these things used to be a lot more serious. Nowadays, we have some more, we have better treatments for pneumonia and encephalitis. So uh, here's some numbers for you, right? Uh, 300,000 to 400,000 cases in Canada each year. So there's a, a little graph from um, Public Health Canada, and you can see uh, here we are, 1963. Uh, we have the vaccine introduced. Looks like there's a little bit of decline in general from that. I'm not sure what, what the cause would be from that. But uh, then over the years, we basically eliminated measles in 1998. Now, if you do look at the numbers, uh, you will find that in 1998, I think there were five cases or eight cases or something like that. There were a number of years where we had less than 10 cases of measles in Canada. So why do they say it was eliminated? Because all those cases were imported. Uh, it means that somebody from another country uh, uh, got it in another country and maybe they weren't vaccinated and came to Canada. And then eventually, you know, they realized they had measles and got treated. Um, unfortunately, uh, like I said before, with people not getting their children vaccinated, the number of cases have kind of, you know, they've gone up a little bit, right? So uh, uh, this year is kind of an anomaly. There's only been one case of measles in 2020. Uh, last year it was 113. Uh, so, you know, the, we do get these outbreaks here and there in schools and, and whatnot. And, uh, you know, people who, who didn't get their, their children vaccinated, unfortunately, are, are going to be very susceptible and very likely to get cases. Uh, once in a while, there's some really extreme outbreaks. I can't remember what year it was. There was one year where there were a whole bunch of cases somewhere in Quebec. 
Uh, another year there was, I think it was 2014 or 2015, there were 100 cases, I think it was Disneyland or something like that. So you see it in the news because it is super, super infectious. So this year, why only one case? Um, probably because nobody's getting out. You know, just kind of the reality here, right? People aren't getting out, they're being more cautious, uh, which is, uh, shows that some of the, the stuff we're doing, the, uh, the distancing and the masks is, is working. And uh, we have some similar data, by the way, for other respiratory infections. The number of flu cases are, have been down this year and, uh, and those kind of things, which is, which is uh, interesting to see. So um, kind of the last thing to say about measles is um, there's another virus that sometimes gets confused with measles. Uh, so measles is, is often called uh, rubiola, but there's another virus called rubella. So you can see the confusion, very similar words. And, and, and sometimes there are, uh, rubella is called German measles, right? So uh, why are they confused? Well, they have kind of a similar rash, um, similar name. Uh, they are different viruses. You can see one is a, is a negative stranded RNA virus, the other is a positive stranded RNA virus. And, um, and both of them are found, uh, are, are basically eliminated for most people uh, due to vaccination. And, uh, and they're actually even found in the same vaccine formulation. A couple of things to say about rubella and measles, trying to, to uh, combine them in one package, is uh, both of them are very dangerous for pregnant women. Uh, and uh, this used to be a huge fear before these vaccines came out. If you were pregnant and uh, you did not want to get measles or rubella, uh, because it can cause uh, birth defects in stillborn babies, which is, uh, of course, uh, uh, horrifying if you're, if you're pregnant. Um, like I said, the good news is these are preventable. That's, uh, you know, the MMRV vaccine. That's mumps, measles, rubella, varicella. So uh, totally preventable. And uh, the good thing about this particular vaccine is that the measles vaccine and the rubella vaccine um, is very, very effective. We're talking about, I think, 96% effective. Um, most vaccines do not get that kind of effectiveness. They're very, very effective, which is really, really remarkable. So effective that uh, you don't get symptoms and you can't even detect infection. So it's preventing infection entirely, these, these vaccines. All these vaccines, the MMRV, all, all four of those uh, are attenuated virus vaccines, by the way. Okay, so um, there are other uh, viral skin infections, and I guess the one notable one that I, I didn't include here is uh, the papillomavirus, and uh, I think because I have that included with our sexually transmitted infections, but of course there's not just genital warts, there's other kind of warts as well, and there's a few other infections out there uh, that, uh, that pop up here and there. Some of them are associated with animals, um, you know, some cause uh, wart-like illnesses and whatnot, but like I said, we just can't cover everything in this class. So let's talk a little bit about fungal skin infections. Uh, kind of, I included uh, um, uh, yeast in here, which I guess is more for the oral uh, section of the course, but uh, uh, worth mentioning, I'll probably come back to it uh, when, we, when we talk about digestive um, infections. So yeast infections are usually caused by uh, Candida albicans. There are other Candidas out there, and some of them are very dangerous. They're just a little bit more rare. Uh, this is the common one. So we talked about, of course, uh, thrush, which is, uh, on the tongue, and you can see uh, this uh, child here uh, it, it has sort of that pasty growth on it, and, and um, yeah, it doesn't look like fun. And of course, there's uh, vaginal yeast infections we talked about as well, uh, sometimes called vaginitis. Vaginitis means an um, inflammation of the vagina, and there can be bacterial vaginitis as well, uh, but often we're talking about uh, uh, vaginal yeast infections. So, uh, you know, what, what is going on here? Well, it's just kind of like a lot of these organisms that infect the skin and other mucosal areas is they're growing there and, uh, and they're, um, you know, getting into those tissues and they're causing uh, basically a little bit of an immune response. So inflammation, which can, uh, you know, lead to a little bit of itchiness and, and heat. And then sometimes you get uh, other immune secretions, which, uh, you know, can cause, uh, you know, discharges and things like that. So um, the big group of um, fungal skin infections are called uh, tinea. And so tinea is not a species name, that just, it means for some reason skin mycosis, uh, which uh, mycosis means a, a, an infection, right? And there's a huge, huge, huge number of these fungi 
of which they're rarely ever classified because our antifungal drugs actually work really well. And uh, many of these are usually, uh, I don't know if they're ever uh, life-threatening unless, uh, unless you have AIDS in some cases. Uh, so they're usually just named after the body part, basically saying you have, a, you have a fungal infection of the feet, right? So tinea pedis. Usually we just call it athlete's foot. Uh, you can get tinea of all sorts of other body parts, the scalp, uh, you know, the, uh, the groin area, fingernails and whatnot. And like I said, the, the fungi itself isn't usually classified. Uh, there's a huge number of organisms, although there are, you know, some usual suspects like any of these infections. Um, rarely classified because our antifungals work so well in most cases. Sometimes we call these skin infections ringworm as well, and that's more um, uh, of a description of what the actual uh, rash looks like. So just keep in mind that ringworm is not caused by a worm, okay? Ringworm is not caused by a worm. Why am I saying that twice? Because last year I had it on the final exam and a lot of people got that wrong. Ringworm is caused by various species of fungus. It's just describing the rash. I don't know why they call it ringworm. Uh, I didn't name it. Uh, I would have not named it that if it was me, but the name has stuck and you see it everywhere. And so you can see what the rash looks like. And uh, I don't really know a lot um, uh, about the physiology as to why the rash looks like that. There's probably a reason, um, but uh, you know, again, something that can be treated by antifungal. So how are these things spread? Well, fungi are just kind of found everywhere. Uh, some of them are found in the soil, some of them are found in other humans, uh, pets. Um, you know, they, they can just be transmitted very easily uh, by all sorts of fomites. And, uh, you, know, um, you know, change rooms uh, where, where there's moisture, you know, those are good places for fungi to hide. And uh, there's been uh, lots of cases of uh, like athlete's foot associated to uh, you know, sports teams uh, sharing towels and things like that, right? So, you know, don't share your towel. Uh, you know, it's probably a good idea to not to do that. Just, you know, particularly if it's not clean, um, you know, that's obviously a big deal. Prevention, uh, keeping skin clean and dry. If you get athlete's foot, uh, you know, sometimes there's, there's different things you can do to your shoes to kind of sterilize them. And, uh, but that's kind of a big deal, right? I've had athlete's foot myself. I uh, remember, I think it was two or three years in a row, I kind of got it every spring. And, and that was kind of part of the, the big deal was, uh, you know, drying my shoes properly. You know, in the spring, it's moist and you're, you're, you're spending more time outside. You're leaving your shoes on for a long time and sweating in there. So I would change up my shoes, you know, use a different, uh, you know, alternate days and, and, and try to clean them out really well. And I had to actually get, you know, uh, ointment for, for them as well. And so the, the treatment, there's a whole bunch of them uh, out there. Uh, the, the treatment I had was Lamisil. It's actually not an azole. It's actually a drug of a different mechanism, I believe. Um, but a common, common type of antifungals are these azoles, which is uh, just describing a certain chemistry uh, to these things. And there's a whole bunch of them uh, and uh, all sorts of different names. I can't keep track of all, half of them. There's, there's quite, a, quite a bunch out there. You can see this one has right in the name myconazole. Uh, so it's taught, it has azole right in the name. Uh, but like I said, there's a whole bunch of them out there. So there are a few uh, parasites we talked about as being involved in skin infections, multicellular parasites. So we talked about lice, of course. There's three types of lice. There is head lice, uh, body lice, and pubic lice. So um, the uh, head lice and pubic lice uh, they're different species and they, they just prefer a uh, certain, uh, I don't know if there's something about the chemistry or the coarseness of the hair that they cling on to. Body lice uh, don't cling on to hair, they cling on to clothes um, and also are a separate species. But they feed on blood and cause, you know, discomfort and itching and those kind of things. And uh, in some cases they can spread uh, things like typhus, which is a type of uh, salmonella, um, uh, certain diseases as well. Uh, scabies, that's a mite. So remember, a mite is not an insect. It has eight legs and it burrows into the skin, found in the soil. I don't think it's as common in Canada um, because of uh, winter. Again, a good reason for winter. I know at the moment people are thinking they want spring, but winter is a good way to get rid of uh, a lot of tropical and other diseases. But it does happen in scabies. People travel, of course, and we do have summer. And I think it's more associated with uh, warmer parts of Canada. But I could be wrong on that. 
another one we mentioned were the uh, schistosomes. So there's a whole bunch of schistosomes that are involved in, uh, in these life cycles, usually with animals and snails. And uh, this one here, the duck schistosome is involved in ducks and snails. And of course, once in a while, it gets into a human skin and it doesn't really cause an infection, it dies, but it might cause some inflammation or an allergic response, which we call a swimmer's itch. Uh, so that one's not fun. All right, let me just take a look at the time and see where we are. Okay, 11.30. All right, so like I said, we have a huge number of things to talk about in this unit, and um, we're not gonna get through it all today. This is, I think I, was, I had budgeted about three lectures for this, but we do have a little bit of time to start talking about respiratory infections. Probably we will not get through this whole thing, uh, but uh, there's a number of respiratory infections. Uh, um, some of them we've kind of talked about already. I wanna kind of cover a little bit more ground on tuberculosis, which I don't know if I'll quite get to that today and uh, next day we'll talk about some viruses so we want to talk about influenza we want to talk about SARS and COVID-19 and, uh, and a few other infections are worth discussing. So the respiratory system uh, usually includes the lungs upper and lower respiratory tract sometimes it uh, we include the ears and sinuses in there and uh, you can see from that list there you've got the usual suspects we've got staphylococcus we have streptococcus, so uh, that's just a small list. You're gonna see some other organisms in these lists here. So we also have the pharyn uh, <laughs> pharyngitis, which is an inflammation of the throat, so you might have a sore throat. Pneumonia is inflammation of the lungs and uh, usually involves uh, some sort of fluid. So we'll talk about pneumonia here in a moment. So remember when we were talking about the immune system that we have uh, a, uh, a protective system in our respiratory uh, tract called the mucociliary escalator. And uh, this is a bunch of uh, basically cilia. So if you remember what a cilia is, it's kind of, uh, it's actually shown right here. They're kind of like little uh, tiny, very, very skinny finger-like projections from these cells. And some uh, microorganisms actually use cilia to swim, like tiny, tiny, tiny little paddles. Um, our cells are not swimming around, but they're moving fluid, and in this case, they're moving mucus. So I mentioned that this is this mucus is found all throughout the system. It traps microorganisms and dust particles and whatever else we breathe in. You know, we're breathing how many times a minute, and uh, we're definitely bringing in dust particles. And uh, it gets trapped in the mucus, and these cilia they kind of just slowly paddle and push it up. So on a normal day, you don't even notice this happens, it kind of gets to the back of your throat and then goes down and you, you swallow it and you don't even know. When you're sick, of course, uh, you might make a whole bunch more mucus. And so you're coughing it up or, or whatever, right? And, and, uh, and you're feeling it and it's a little less pleasant. But that's a, actually a very good system for protecting our respiratory uh, tract. And uh, our respiratory tract is not 100% sterile, but pretty close, at least when, you're not, when you don't have an infection. And uh, so that's, that's a good thing when we have this. Okay, so let's kind of start at the top of the respiratory tract. And um, I, I, uh, I have some uh, digestive things to talk about next day, which uh, I'm not gonna include here, but I do wanna talk about uh, strep throat. So strep throat is usually caused by group A strep, streptococcus pyogenes. There are a few other group A strep that, again, not mentioning everything in this class, and, uh, and, and this is very painful. Uh, I remember having this years ago and uh, like I just I couldn't swallow anything. And I, I don't know how old I was at the time, but I remember, you know, to my excitement, my mom bought me a thing of ice cream that I could eat the whole thing by myself, uh, which is pretty exciting at the time when like I said, I don't know how old I was. Um, I do remember, uh, my mom looking in my throat and I think she mentioned the red dots and, and I think I, I went to the mirror and I uh, tried, tried to see them and maybe I saw them with a flashlight. But the red dots are often kind of a characteristic sign of, of strep throat. Um, there is a, a, a rapid strep test that's been out for a number of years now. There's a few different ones. I remember one of the ones I saw was called carrot orange. And uh, basically a, a swab, uh, the throat and it's, a, it's some sort of enzymatic reaction that happens and this color ends up in a test tube. And, 
So, so if you think you have strep throat, um, they do this at the pharmacies now. And uh, unfortunately, I think uh, I brought my son in and found out there was a $15 charge. But, uh, you know, it was a lot better than, than waiting, you know, an hour or two in a clinic. I, I, got, I got to do it right away. Uh, the one thing about the rapid strep tests is that um, they're not that accurate. I think they're only 85, 90% accurate. And so, um, you know, uh, I'm just remembering now I actually had a strep throat, I think when I was a university student as well. And, uh, and uh, what happened in that situation is they did the rapid test and it came back negative. And I'm like, I'm pretty sure I have strep throat, like those spots, right? And, uh, and then they did a swab and they did an overnight culture. And the overnight culture uh, revealed that it had, of course, uh, strep throat. So in that case, it's probably just a quick gram stain is what they're looking at. And they see the, uh, the streptococcus. Remember, strep means chain, right? And coccus means uh, spheres. So they're going to see a chain of, of little purple uh, cells uh, and then prescribe you just a cheap uh, penicillin of some sort. Um, so yeah, sometimes other symptoms, swollen, swollen lymph nodes, again, when you've got an immune reaction, um, swollen lymph nodes can be pretty common in some cases. Uh, usually, you know, not life-threatening unless the streptococcus gets into other body systems. And this particular version of streptococcus can get into all sorts of uh, body systems. And uh, like, for example, toxic shock syndrome can cause a, a serious disease. So uh, I think I said some of these things already about group A strep or streptococcus pyogenes. Like I said, there's a few other group A strep out there. Uh, sometimes the acronym you might see GAS. Oopsies, there we go, GAS. Uh, it is uh, the one organism that we mentioned is uh, beta hemolytic on, on blood agar. So it's uh, giving the full uh, clearing around the colonies. And, uh, and this organism, like I said, can cause all sorts of other diseases and some that we've mentioned already, the flesh eating disease, toxic shock syndrome, uh, there's something called scarlet fever, which uh, I, I'm not sure what the distinction between, uh, I don't actually know a lot about scarlet fever, um, but uh, I just know it's, it's associated with uh, streptococcus and sometimes strep throat. So I'm guessing this has something to do with the uh, organism getting into the blood and causing, causing a fever. Someone's mentioning they had it uh, three times and it was brutal. So yeah, I can imagine. I just remember not being able to eat food. I was so hungry uh, because I just couldn't swallow anything. Even the ice cream was painful. So what can we say about Streptococcus pyogenes? Um, again, this is an organism that is really pathogenic because it has a whole bunch of uh, virulence factors. And uh, this is a little image from the textbook kind of highlighting some of them. And uh, you can see it's mentioning uh, it has a capsule. So here's, here's the capsule. Of course, that just wants to go to the next slide. So I had mentioned, I think somewhere I mentioned way back about capsules in that they're, uh, they're good for two, two reasons. One, they help the organism to stick to a surface and they help it to uh, be resistant to um, phagocytosis by immune cells. So interestingly enough, there's been people studying this organism. And if you, uh, if you remove the capsules, you can do this genetically. Um, they're basically not pathogenic at all. Uh, you could eject it into the blood of an organism and the immune system deals, it, deals with it. Whereas uh, with the capsule, it can be, that could be a fatal type of injection. Uh, here's the M protein. So remember the M protein was um, uh, mentioned in that video uh, that I showed you on the humoral immune response. Uh, it also has some toxins. So I mentioned this one here that causes toxic shock syndrome. And uh, there is a mention about scarlet fever and the rash it causes. And then there's a the hemolysis. So this, this uh, organism is a good one to mention because it has a lot of, a lot of things that we have, uh, we've discussed already. I think there's a couple of comments. Someone saying they had scarlet fever and uh, felt like they were hit by a truck. So yeah, that's, that's never good. Um, you know, it's so easy to take our bodies for, uh, you know, and, and, uh, you know, um, for granted when we're healthy and then we realize, you know, how nasty it is when we get sick. So there are other um, infections that kind of uh, can infect uh, similar parts, right? Um, one worth mentioning just very briefly is diphtheria. Uh, 
So diphtheria, I can never spell diphtheria. It's not an easy one to spell uh, with all those H's in there. Uh, but uh, this organism here is worth mentioning just for this reason here, is it probably no one here has had diphtheria because if we've had vaccine, then the vaccine is against the toxin. So that's just a classic example of a toxoid vaccine. Um, the diphtheria toxin, by the way, just shuts down your ribosomes and so the cells die. And um, uh, like I said, this is one of these diseases that uh, uh, probably none of us will, will ever see in our lifetime because of uh, thanks to vaccines. My great grandmother died of diphtheria. And uh, so that's my closest connection to this disease. So a whole bunch of other uh, uh, diseases worth mentioning. Some of these are um, caused by specific organisms. So pertussis, you can see, is on that list. So pertussis is sort of famously known as whooping cough. And uh, this is caused by an organism called Bordetella pertussis. So you can see where the name of the uh, disease or the organism, I don't know which was named first, came from. And uh, this is another one that uh, I'm just young enough to have never experienced it or knowing it, but um, I remember my mom saying my sister had it as well. And she remembers the horrible cough. So there's probably videos where you, you can on YouTube people with it. So it must be a horrible sound. I, I don't really have a desire to, to listen to that particular sound myself. Um, but uh, this vaccine, unfortunately, is not 90 something percent effective. I think this one is more like 80 percent. Um, so there, there's a lot more cases uh, kind of annually than you would see uh, uh, normally because the, the vaccine, for whatever reason, just doesn't quite always hold in everybody. And uh, this vaccine, there's actually a couple of vaccines for pertussis out there. Um, but uh, one of the vaccines is also a toxoid vaccine. Uh, so against the toxin caused by the microorganism. So you can see these other infections I have listed on here are uh, basically named after the body system. And, um, you know, so sinusitis is inflammation of the sinuses. Otitis is inflammation of the, of the ears. And uh, they're worth mentioning because if you take a look, you've got these same organisms popping up again and again and again. We've got streptococcus. So this is a, a different streptococcus than we were just talking about. Uh, streptococcus pneumonia. Uh, we've got staphylococcus there as well. And uh, this guy here, Haemophilus, which I kind of left off the list of organisms because like I said, we can't cover everything, but you're going to see that organism on our list a number of times, Haemophilus, uh, because it's, it's a good um, kind of uh, opportunistic pathogen as well. But uh, I'm not expecting you to know that organism for this class. So let's spend a few minutes talking about pneumonia and that will, I guess, probably wrap up today's lecture. Uh, so pneumonia can be caused by quite a number of things, although usually it's a sign of infection. So pneumonia is basically inflammation in the lungs and during that inflammation process, the lungs start filling up with fluids. And um, that can be seen on an X-ray and uh, you can see in that X-ray there, um, it's uh, pretty obviously abnormal. And, uh, you can see, uh, like I said, that's usually one of the diagnost diagnostic uh, things they look for. Uh, you know, after you put a stethoscope to someone's chest, uh, pneumonia apparently has a, a certain sound to it. And then, you know, you get the x-ray to kind of confirm uh, what's going on there. So this is a leading cause of death worldwide, by the way. Uh, pneumonia, uh, people don't always have access to treatment. I have a good friend. And he had, um, I think it was a cousin or an aunt or a second cousin uh, that died in, of pneumonia uh, in the States. And the person unfortunately didn't have a health care plan and kind of waited to the last minute to get treatment and, and eventually uh, died of it, which is, you know, this, this does happen. And pneumonia can be very, very nasty for people that are immunocompromised. So a lot of elderly people uh, die of pneumonia because their body just can't handle uh, the infection and sometimes by the time they get treated it's too late. So um, what causes pneumonia? Like I said, many, 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 many things. Uh, but the number one cause is usually streptococcus pneumonia. So I've mentioned this organism quite a few times. It's kind of being the primary cause of pneumonia. I think I have another, another slide, but I think it's about 60 or 70 percent of pneumonias are caused by uh, streptococcus. Uh, many other causes uh, there's viral causes as well. I'll talk about viral pneumonia in a moment, uh, but you can see the usual organisms on the list. We have Staphylococcus, we have Pseudomonas, we have E. coli, 
couple others on there. There's something called Klebsiella pneumonia. Again, I'm not going to talk about it in this class, um, but uh, it's kind of similar to some of the other organisms. I think it's a gram negative that can, that can form uh, uh, biofilms, uh, but another cause of, of pneumonia. So let's talk about Streptococcus for a minute. Um, so this uh, Streptococcus uh, pneumonia is not uh, one of the group strep, right? It's not group A, B, or C, um, because the original Lancefield guy who did that grouping didn't include this one. So it's just kind of in its own group. It's alpha hemolytic and usually is kind of green on a blood agar. And there's the number, uh, 60%. And uh, usually the standard treatment is some sort of penicillin. Although in the last 10 years, we're starting to see a bit of resistance. Uh, so, um, you know, I feel like I'm talking about myself too many times, but I've had pneumonia and uh, I had pneumonia last year and it was not fun. And uh, I went through two different rounds of treatment for my pneumonia. And it's possible uh, whatever I had was uh, resistant the first time around. Um, so it was not a fun experience. Um, but the good news is we have some vaccines against this organism now. And uh, um, there's a few different ones um, that uh, uh, having a little hard time keeping track of these because the last one I was looking at was called Pneumovax. 19. And then I looked this one up and now it's called Pneumovax 23. So where does the 19 and the 23 come from? Um, these are all, uh, for the most part, polysaccharide conjugate vaccines. So what does that mean? It means that these vaccines are the carbohydrates from the surface of these cells. So some sort of uh, uh, probably capsule of carbohydrates. And so what they've done is they've made them synthetically. So you get a chemist to make this carbohydrate uh, and uh, Pneumovax 23 has 23 different carbohydrates, so it protects you against, I guess, 23 different strains. And uh, there's uh, this Prenovar 13, I guess it's 13 strains, and I think that one in particular is given uh, now as a part of the uh, routine child vaccination. So I'd have to look that one up. I know it's definitely not something that I had as a child, but I think now it's, it's routine, and I think that's a relatively new thing. Although, again, I'd have to, I'd have to look that one up. Uh, a couple of comments, someone saying they had pneumonia a number of times as a child. Yeah, so that's, that's not fun. Uh, and being allergic to penicillin uh, makes it a little bit harder to treat. So someone's asking, do we need to know the treatment for each infection? Uh, it doesn't hurt. Again, I'll kind of touch on that uh, when we look at our re review. Um, you know, treatments are part of, uh, you know, the course, of cor uh, but certainly not quite the, the main uh, focus in the last part of the course because uh, we covered that in the previous uh, section. But like I said, kind of just reviewing some things here uh, uh, with these organisms. But I want to just finish off talking a little bit about viral pneumonia. Uh, and, uh, you know, it has a number of causes as well. So uh, what is viral pneumonia? It's a pneumonia caused by a viral infection. And uh, these are pretty common in children, apparently. And I don't know what the mechanism behind that is. Probably just that children don't have uh, immunity to a number of infections. There's all sorts of respiratory infections that children get. And, uh, you, you know, it seems like, uh, you know, toddlers and young children, it's like they have a runny nose every other week. Uh, some of these infections are just infecting the nose. Sometimes they get deeper into that respiratory system. So we're looking at all sorts of cold viruses, um, um, influenza viruses. There's a virus called para-influenza, which usually gives cold-like symptoms, but sometimes it gets deeper into the, uh, into the airways. And, uh, and like I said, huge number of these things, and uh, mostly we're treating the symptoms, right? Penicillin uh, does not help. And, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of, uh, you know, the, the takeaway message here. Um, and, uh, you know, often they're looking at, uh, uh, I, um, I can't remember what I was going to say. But, yeah, that's kind of the main thing to know is, right, penicillin isn't going to help with viral infections. And, um, whereas it will help with, uh, with bacterial infections. So I think, yeah, I think I got this section on tuberculosis next, but uh, it's not really worth it getting into that because that's a, that's a good chunk of, of what we want to talk about. So we're going to wrap that up here for now. Like I said, uh, if you have some ideas of things you want to focus on uh, for the review session next, review session or sessions next week, um, you know, let me know and I'll try to incorporate that in when we get to next week. I see there are some good questions today and I'll try to address them next week, uh, you know, when we, when we do the review. So that is it for today. So hopefully you have a great Tuesday and, uh, um, 
you know, uh, take care.